All right, so in this video, we're going to be, again, going through some of the RSES, Refrigeration Service Engineer Society, Nate Prep PowerPoint presentation. It's just sort of a guideline to talk about some condenser or outdoor unit installation best practices. And so if you want to find this presentation yourself, you can actually purchase it through the RSES store. This is part of the AC heat pump training PowerPoint presentation, and this is actually an excerpt from Chapter 5 of that. So first thing, when you're going to be replacing an outdoor unit, um, replacing it, uh, doing a change out on the entire system, whatever, working on the outside system, again, whether it's new construction or retrofit applications, the first thing you want to do is check for transportation damage. This is a big mistake that I see a lot of technicians make. They fail to ensure that the equipment is in proper condition and that it is the right equipment before they go to install it. The next thing on the list here is to refer to nameplate voltage requirements. This is common where you have a system that is a three-phase system and someone tries to install it on single phase or vice versa. You have to make sure that you've got the right equipment and it has the right voltage on the data tag. You will notice that a lot of times condensing units are rated for 208 voltage, meaning using only two legs of a three-phase traditional 208 three-phase Y power versus the 240 that we typically see in residential split phase. And so in a lot of cases, the rating as far as how low the voltage can go is quite a bit lower than what the highest voltage on the positive side is. Generally speaking, on the positive side, they're doing plus or minus 10% off of 230 volts. You're going to find that most equipment nowadays is still rated at 230 volts as the baseline rather than what we actually see, which is more like 240, maybe even a little more than that in a lot of cases. And so 230 plus or minus 10%, 230 plus 10%, which is generally what we're looking at is 253 volts. So you want to see almost always on single phase equipment, you want to see below 253. But then on the low side, you're not going to have quite as much tolerance on the 208 side. Again, it, this varies for equipment to equipment, but this is why you need to make sure that you check your voltage ratings before you install the equipment. Now, again, in 2010, which is what this slide is talking about, uh, a lot of the R22 uh, system stopped being manufactured. So even though it's been 10 years since that point, that was really the cutoff date other than some dry shipped units. There were some units that were shipped with no R22 and they had to be field charged. And some of those were installed well after 2010. But in general, especially for most of the new construction market, we stopped seeing R22 equipment installed at 2010, even though only now, January 1st, 2020, did we see the restriction where you can no longer manufacture or import R22. We still have plenty of it in stock. We can still definitely use it, but it can no longer be manufactured or imported. And so now we're mostly dealing with R410A. Most of you have been dealing with this for many years. One of the big changes with R410A is that they all come with PoE oil versus mineral oil. And a common misconception is that R22 equipment couldn't work with PoE oil when actually it could. PoE oil can work with essentially every type of modern refrigerant that we work with, but we use mineral oil because it was less expensive, more readily available, and it wasn't so hygroscopic. And what that means is, is that when you're working with something that has PoE oil in it, like an R410A system, you have to be even more careful than you ever were about making sure that the system is clean, dry, and tight, that we keep that moisture and oxygen away from that PoE oil and refrigerant. Now, this is mentioning that R410A is 50 to 70% higher pressures than R22. That's something, again, if you've been working in the industry for any amount of time, you know that initially everybody was concerned about the higher pressures, but that's ended up not really being a big deal at all and uh, not, not something that's difficult to overcome once you understand the pressure and temperature relationships. Charging is really no different other than that we just noticed that the pressures are higher. Another thing is, especially when working with uh, modern refrigerants that use PoE, we need to make sure that anytime that system is open for service or we have the refrigerant circuit open to atmosphere, that we follow all of our best practices, such as purging with nitrogen, flowing nitrogen, pulling a really good deep vacuum, and then also replacing those line filter dryers, those liquid line filter dryers, whenever the system is open to atmosphere, because those can become contaminated with air and moisture while the system is open. A key thing also, because some people will talk about triple evacuation, which isn't a bad practice. Sometimes it's not necessary. When employing a triple evacuation, make sure to break with dry nitrogen, not with air, to prevent some of that moisture from being drawn back into the system by opening it to atmosphere. And this illustration here shows that while charging a system with R410A or really any blend refrigerant, you should be charging with the tank upside down to ensure that you're charging via liquid. And in the process of charging, you need to make sure that you're not actually injecting liquid into the compressor itself. Now, many heat pump systems that you're going to work on will have accumulators in the condenser, which sort of act as a method of regulating the refrigerant into the compressor. So it's okay if you get a little bit of liquid into the accumulator, but keep in mind that that accumulator is going to act as a trap for liquid 
liquid refrigerant and you may add in refrigerant and not notice that your pressures are going up as quickly as you would think and you could end up really overcharging the system, which is why the best practice when charging any piece of equipment is always use a scale and always meter it in slowly to make sure that you don't accidentally overcharge the system. All right, here's just some best practices for locating an outdoor unit. Now, always follow your manufacturer's specifications because they're going to address a lot of these same things and not every piece of equipment's the same, but these are just some good general rules. So you want to locate the system away from building or plants by one to two feet. Again, the more space you can give it, the easier it's going to be for serviceability and the more airflow is going to be able to travel around the unit, which can help with its efficiency. The next thing is, is that you need clear space above the unit and that's generally five feet. And this is for up discharge uh, units. Obviously, if it's a side discharge ductless, then you need space uh, out of the side discharge. Also think about if you have top discharge and side discharge systems near each other, you don't want to discharge a side discharge unit into the condenser of an up discharge unit, which we've seen quite a bit actually. You want to make sure that it's elevated above the snow line and drifts, which obviously depends on your local climate, how much you need to elevate it or where you need to position it. Have plenty of space around the condenser for condensate to drain, especially in heat pump systems. Now, if you're talking about the location of a condensate drain from the inside, that varies from location to location, municipality to municipality. Here in Florida, we drain it outside on the ground. And in those cases, we want to make sure that we're draining it in a location where that condensate's not going to cause a nuisance, such as on a sidewalk or driveway, something that's going to cause a slip hazard. Don't locate an outdoor unit under a window, especially if it's an egress window, meaning a window that's designed for escape in the case of a fire. So if you are going to locate it in front of a window, which in some cases you don't have a choice, it may be the existing location, just always make sure that it is not a required egress window. But another factor with windows is it's also a noise factor. So it's really wise, if at all possible, to keep it away from the windows and doors. Avoid drainage from the roof. So think about where water is going to come down a roof, especially if you don't have gutters. If you have a valley and a roof, you don't want that to dump right in the unit because that can cause damage over time. Always keep it away from dryer and kitchen vents. You don't want kitchen grease or dryer lint to make it into that condenser. That's a really big factor, and we see this all the time. There's many cases where we will move a condensing unit away from its original location simply to get it away from a dryer vent. And then make sure that you have a solid level pad. I mean, this stands to reason, but you'd be amazed some of the really flimsy pads that this equipment goes onto, and that can cause vibration, which leads to leaks and other problems over time. So make sure that it's solid. And in most cases, you want to go ahead and anchor that down. In Florida, that's part of our wind code, and so we're required to properly anchor these things down. But in general, that's just a good best practice. Now, some manufacturers will actually tell you to pitch the pad slightly away from the structure and in the case of a heat pump. So that way, if there is condensate, it drains away from the structure. But in general, level is really the best bet. And if you are going to pitch it away, just very, very slightly. Now, when piping in an air conditioning refrigeration system, use ACR tubing only. Don't use tubing that was designed for plumbing. First of all, the sizes aren't the same in between ACR tubing and plumbing tubing. So you're going to run into problems there. But also, ACR tubing is sealed and filled with dry nitrogen. It's designed for use in a clean, dry, and tight system where plumbing, copper, you just don't need to be as careful because it's designed to have water flowing through it. When you are piping in refrigerant piping, purge nitrogen while brazing. And I prefer to say purge nitrogen. That means displace the air in the first place and then flow nitrogen at a very, very low flow rate. On average, you're going to say two to five SCFH. That's cubic feet per hour or standard cubic feet per hour. CFH, cubic feet per hour, not cubic feet per minute. It's just a whisper of flow. If you don't have a flow gauge, well, you should go out and get one. But in a pinch, you can just use the T-handle on your nitrogen regulator and just barely, barely flow it so that you can just hear it. You don't want to pressurize the system while brazing. You just want to flow a little bit of nitrogen. That displaces the oxygen and it, oxygen and it prevents copper oxide from building up on the inside, which can act as a contaminant, plug up your TXV screens, filter dryers, things like that. It's a really nice best practice and not hard to actually do once you get the hang of it. Proper filler and flux must be used. Now keep in mind that in copper to copper applications where you're using a phos copper or a sil phos rod, you have the phosphorus acts as the fluxing agent. So you don't need to use additional flux in most cases. If you are working with copper to brass, copper to steel, brass to steel, something like that, then you would want to use an additional paste flux. But always when you are using a flux, make sure not to use too much so that it ends up getting into the lines. You want to use just a nice little coating um, to ensure that you flux the joint without getting flux into the system lines. And always wipe it off when you're done. Now, there are some fluxes that are non-corrosive, but just to be safe, I suggest as a general practice, once you're done brazing and the joint has cooled, wipe it off so that way you don't potentially leave some of that corrosive flux in place. Now, when we say brazing, brazing, it says here is a form of welding, and it depends on how you think of welding. The technical term uh, that is often used for welding is when you're actually melting 
the base material as well as the filler rod. So if you're welding steel, you're actually melting the steel in order to bond steel together. In the case of brazing, you're not actually melting the base material. You're not melting copper or brass or aluminum or whatever you're working with. You're just heating it up to the point that the filler metal melts. And so this here says heats metals, base metals above 700 degrees. You know, there's some debate about that. A lot of people say 800, 850 degrees in that range. That's where brazing starts. When you're lower temperatures than that, we'll call it soldering. The rods that you use in brazing we call a brazing alloy or a filler alloy. It's not really a solder. Solder is specifically that lower temperature application. When you're brazing, you use brazing alloys and fluxes specifically designed for brazing. Not all fluxes are the same for every job, so make sure you're not using a soldering flux if you're working in a brazing application. Most brazing fluxes are of a white paste type, although they do make a very nice high temperature black paste flux as well that you may find useful. When you are brazing using industrial gases like acetylene, you have to take great care. And we're going to talk about this in a second. But the most common ways of brazing in our industry, in the HVACR industry, is acetylene. The question is, do we use aerocetylene or do we use oxyacetylene? And both can work just fine. Aerocetylene is a little lower temperature, a little bit larger flame. I mean, it does have some advantages with ease and weight. But oxyacetylene is a hotter, smaller flame and is the widely accepted practice for brazing within our industry in most markets. Keep in mind that the Department of Transportation is the organization that sets the rules for the transport of cylinders. And so you need to make sure that you follow DOT regulations when you're handling and transporting cylinders. You want to be familiar with what those are. And those do change like all regulations. So you want to keep in touch with the current Department of Transportation regulations. You always want to make sure, as a general rule, secure all cylinders. Make sure they can't bounce around. If your cylinders have threads where you can cap them, make sure that they are capped. Some cylinders allow for that, some don't. But regardless, if they do have those cap threads, keep a cap on the cylinders. Close valves and completely mark empty cylinders, meaning that once you're done with the cylinder, make sure it's fully closed and make sure that you mark it. We use blue tape and we mark on the painter's tape when a cylinder is completely empty. Don't use unidentified cylinders and wear proper PPE. I'll also add that most cylinders are best stored upright if possible, and you want to keep make sure that they are securely fastened, like we mentioned before, but also make sure that your regulators are not stored on them when you're transporting them. That's a big mistake that I see because it makes it much easier for those to be knocked off and then essentially creates a, a missile out of a pressurized cylinder. While you may think acetylene is one of the most dangerous cylinders, and it is very dangerous and requires a lot of care, one of the most dangerous cylinders on your truck is nitrogen, and that's just because of the pressure. If that were to bounce around and the top were to knock off, those things turn into rockets and cre can create a lot of damage. While oxygen is not actually explosive or flammable in and of itself, it is required for the burning process. So whenever you have oxygen near a flammable gas like acetylene, it makes it far more dangerous because oxygen, pure oxygen, like you have in your oxygen cylinder, can greatly accelerate that burning process. The cylinders are highly pressurized, so that makes them dangerous. And you want to make sure to never let pure oxygen come in contact with oil or grease. As a best practice, do not oil or grease threads on cylinders. Just in general, just don't do it because you may May use the wrong thing unless you specifically have an oil or grease that's specifically designed for oxygen and acetylene, which they do make. But most technicians out there are just going to take, you know, a 10 weight spout oil or refrigerant oil or something and put it on threads. Don't do that. That can cause a form of instantaneous combustion when that oxygen hits that oil. Whenever you're working with a cylinder, don't stand in front of it when you're opening it, just in case it were to come apart or something were to fly out, that T-handle, whatever. You don't want your body in front of that cylinder. And when you are opening the valves on tanks like oxygen, make sure that you open it all the way so that way it seals the packing. Now, acetylene is actually absorbed into acetone within the cylinder. So it's a case where you actually have a porous material in there and it's, and it's actually in a liquid form inside that tank. So a little different than some of the other gas that you work with. It's not under as high a pressure, but it is very explosive. So acetylene is a compound of carbon and hydrogen. It's versatile. It's inexpensive. That's why we use it. It's a really great gas for what we do, but it is dangerous. And so treat it with that appropriate care that acetylene deserves. Whenever you're working with high pressures, you want to make sure you appropriately use a pressure regulator. I see technicians do this all the time where they'll take a pressure regulator, the dials will be knocked off of it, the thing will be damaged, and they'll keep using it. And that's really unwise. You want to make sure that when you're using a pressure regulator, you turn that T-handle outward. So you turn it counterclockwise until it's loose every time, and then you dial it in to the proper outlet pressure. So that way you're safely increasing, slowly increasing the pressure on your manifold. I see a lot of technicians try to dial it in at their gauges, and that's just not the design of those manifolds. Use your pressure regulator wisely.
But before opening a cylinder valve, ensure that the tension on the regulator adjusting screws is released. Stand so that the cylinder valve is between you and the regulator. Slowly and carefully open the oxygen cylinder valve until the maximum pressure registers on the high pressure gauge. Then open the oxygen cylinder valve completely to seal the valve packing, like we mentioned. Slowly open the fuel gas cylinder valve, and this in this case it would be acetylene, in the same manner. However, do not open the acetylene cylinder more than one and a half turns. So in the case of acetylene, you don't just keep cranking it open. You don't need to seal that. It's not a high pressure cylinder. Keep the cylinder wrench as one as required on the cylinder valve so that you can close the valve quickly if necessary. Don't use a refrigeration wrench and then pull it off and throw it away. Keep it on the acetylene tank while you're servicing it and then only pull it off when you're completely finished. Because oxacetylene brazing is, is commonly used, you need to know a little bit about oxacetylene brazing and what you're looking for in the torches. So always clean the joint before brazing. This is just a good practice anyway. We talk a lot about um, reaming or deburring the fittings. So that's a really good best practice, but make sure when you're doing that, that you're not getting anything into the lines. Also, if you, when you sand and clean a copper, always do it before you cut it. Don't sand and clean on an open end if you can prevent it, because that's only more likelihood that stuff's going to go inside the line. If you're going to be brazing from copper to another metal, you can use a flux and paint it on, but just make sure to do it in a very, very thin layer. Don't, don't just glob it on so that it gets in the line. Purge with nitrogen and generally use a neutral flame. This is always use a neutral flame, but actually you're generally, you're going to use a slightly carbonizing flame often in our trade, which means that you have that, that secondary feather. If you look at the bottom image here, that's the carbonizing flame. That's a very heavy carbonizing flame. Often we're going to use a neutral flame or a slightly carbonizing flame. Upon completion of brazing, when you're done, first shut off the torch oxygen valve, then shut off the torch fuel valve. The reason why a lot of people don't do this, a lot of the reasons why they shut off the acetylene first is because they don't want there to be those little kind of carbon bunnies. A skilled brazer can often kind of turn them off almost simultaneously so that way you don't have so much of that uh, flame, but you don't want to make the mistake of burning it back into the tip. As a new brazer, start with by turning on the acetylene, light it, and then add in your oxygen and then turn it off the same way. So first you turn off your oxygen and then you turn off your acetylene. Also shut off your tanks and then bleed out any leftover oxygen and acetylene that may be in your hoses just for safety so that you don't have that stored in your hoses. Now I'm just going to add in a couple other things quickly. Keep the system clean, dry, and tight just through practical means. If it's raining, don't open your copper. Don't let rainwater get into the copper lines. Don't drop your gauge hoses in the dirt or your copper in the dirt. Make sure to keep the ends of your copper sealed up anytime that you're working until you actually get to the point that you're going to make a connection. Keep Keep it sealed up with tape so that way things don't get into it. When you're reaming, hold it upside down and ream so that the pieces fall out. If you can't do that, sometimes it may be better in, in certain circumstances to not ream than to ream in a fashion that could potentially get some of those burrs into the system. I've seen a lot of technicians will just use needle nose pliers and uh, and ream it that way with the rounded metal on the needle nose inside. It's not as good as actually cutting that burr off, but in, in certain cases, it can prevent that copper from getting into the system. So just very practical things. Keep stuff out of the the inside of the system, purge nitrogen to get all of the oxygen and water vapor out in the first place, and then flow nitrogen while you're brazing. Be really careful when you're working with your torches, wear proper PPE, wear safety glasses, wear gloves, make sure that you're safe when you're brazing. Take your regulators off when you store them in your vehicle. Make sure that the that they're closed tightly and that they're strapped up in a safe position, and you're going to be in much better shape than somebody who doesn't pay close attention to their torches. Hopefully you found that helpful. That's just a brief overview of installing condensers. There's a lot more to it in these presentations from RSES in preparation for Nate, but hopefully you picked up a few things there. And as always, work safe, and we'll see you on the next video. Mm -hmm.